Ladies and gentlemen, the interdisciplinary quick talks Open Data, Open Possibilities is about to begin. Please be reminded to turn your mobile phone to silent mode during the event to avoid disturbing others. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Interdisciplinary Quick Talks, Open Data, Open Possibilities. My name is Harrison Lee, and I'm from the Faculty of Science. Today, I'm honored to serve for your Master of Ceremonies. The Interdisciplinary Quick Talks is a new series launched by the Knowledge Exchange Office to promote interdisciplinarity and to share evidence-based knowledge on challenging issues from multiple perspectives with our community. For this inaugural event, our topic, Open Data, Open Possibilities, is a timely one indeed. Our researchers will share with you their views and project outcomes using open data and discuss their ideas for interdisciplinary research and knowledge exchange that could be made possible by open data. And the relationship between open data and two possible new laws in Hong Kong, namely the archives law and access to information. So without further ado, let's get to the heart of the matter. May I now invite Professor John bacon Schoen, Associate Director of the Knowledge Exchange Office and Director of the Social Sciences Research Center to give us an overview on open data. Professor bacon Schoen, please. Thank you very much. So it's my great pleasure to be here and to welcome all of you here. This is the first of our events and we hope one of many. So, facilitating reuse of public information while minimizing negative consequences is a very long title for my little bit. But that's really what I think we're trying to get at in opening up data. So, as our MC pointed out, there are two Law Reform Commission consultations taking place at the moment one on government records, one on access to information. It is natural that this is a stimulation for discussion on access to information generally. Indeed, one can assume that we will come to the conclusion that use, all useful government information should be archived and should be made accessible unless there is a good reason not to make it accessible. So you're going to hear a little bit more from Stacy later on about it from an archivist perspective. So many people in Hong Kong, including civil servants in many cases, as well as academics, want better access to government data, whether it's for commercial, social, or academic purposes. So how can we achieve this? But of course, it's essential that making that data accessible does not infringe on the data protection law or privacy rights, or indeed on the census ordinance. So we need to address those things. So the government's role is crucial. First of all, because they own or collect so much data. Secondly, because they fund a lot of data through contracts and research grants. And thirdly, they also control a lot of other data indirectly through licensing. So for example, the public transport system, where although it's private companies, they are licensed by the government. So if we look at how well Hong Kong is doing on open data, if you look at our ranking, we don't look too good. Now, I should point out that this index is somewhat out of date. It's at least two years out of date. So we have colleagues here from the, from the data.gov portal. So I'm sure with all their hard work, Hong Kong's ranking is going to improve from its, from its previous version of le, uh, level of 24. Interestingly, Taiwan is number one in terms of this. So what are the key criteria that they use in determining how, how jurisdictions perform? Is the data openly licensed? Is all legal use allowed? This is one area where Hong Kong was a long way behind, but is now quite good. 
Secondly, is it machine readable? The best is something like XML. The worst is images. Thirdly, is it downloadable? You don't need to visit a government office to access it. Fourthly, is it kept up to date if the data changes? Fifthly, is it publicly available for everyone, not just for people who've paid money or have good relationships? And lastly, is it free of charge? So if you look at Hong Kong's strengths and weaknesses, our weaknesses are on administrative boundaries, our company registry data, locational data, meaning ge geographical data, government spending, and land ownership. At the time this was done, they all got a zero score because they either are not open or they're not free of charge or some of the other criteria. So what are the things we can do? So OGCIO has already done quite a lot, implementing best practices to make the data available, uh, converting the administrative boundaries into data sets that meet open data standards. That's something which Hong Kong could do a lot more. We are promised that much more is going to be done. We need to wait and see. And largely, lastly, to change admin practices. So there are some very important data sets which currently are being sold. So the land registry data on building and land ownership, the company registry data, and the lands department data. So again, we know that there are moves to change some of these, but clearly this requires a bit more change because it's not just a matter of giving it away, but how do you address the existing commercial relationships? So the broader Hong Kong context is arguably that data sharing and reuse is good in principle because it enables better policy decisions and better decisions about individuals. The major constraints are privacy, ownership, and security. Now, we, of course, also need to be well aware that the mainland is very different to us. They have a very different trade-off between personal data about public good and private good. You just need to look at the social credit system to see that. So, in the past, the Hong Kong government's attitude was very conservative. Their standard response was that there are risks of sharing information, so don't share it unless there's a precedent even if it's not personal data. So my classic example was I wanted police data on crimes at the district level, and I was told it was impossible, even though I know that data exists. So we have no records law. We have no freedom of information law. We do have a code of access, but it is extremely weak. Just to give you three examples, those exemptions include disclosure would harm or prejudice competitive or financial position, or the property interests of the government. Well, that can be used to exempt almost anything if you choose to use it that way. Secondly, information could only be made available by unreasonable diversion of a department's resources. Well, you can make almost anything sound unreasonable if, you, if it suits you. And then lastly, that disclosure could be misleading. Obviously, that one is a serious one. Or deprive the department or any other person of priority of publication or commercial value. In other words, if we sold it to anyone else, we can't give it to you. So census data. So in Hong Kong, census data, the questionnaires are destroyed after the data has been transferred. That is unlike many other places where the census data is locked away for maybe a century and then released. So this has historical consequences. We cannot go back and ask questions about the census that was done a century ago in Hong Kong, unlike in other places. However, in Hong Kong, the census tables have been available for free for quite a long time, and they also allow secure access to data sets via the enclave, at least for academic purposes. So this is a problem if you're a historian, not such a problem if you're a statistician. What about public registers? Well, the data protection law says about access and correction prior to proposed adverse administrative or private decisions and matching approval only if the competing social need overrides the privacy interest. So there is a use limitation exemption in the law, but this is often not explicit. What is the purpose? So the judiciary data, for example, they put up on their website, there is no purpose stated. So what is or is not a use? And that has caused problems with startups who tried to use that judiciary data and got into trouble with the privacy commissioner. So what about health records? So Hong Kong is a very special case because our public hospitals are nearly free. 
So they're very widely used and they have a very complete electronic record system. But that also covers the public health clinics, including the sexual hygiene clinics. And unfortunately, the e-health record law, which the government is very proud of, says that you either opt in for all or nothing. So you cannot choose to exclude some of your medical records. You either make them all accessible or none of them accessible. So big data enthusiasts want access to the data for good reason. But there is a problem that they assume anonymity solves the problem. But the problem is you can re-identify people from the data sets. So there are problems in these situations. So what about research data access? So if you look overseas, most universities are required to make public research data publicly available after a suitable period of time and subject to privacy constraints. We do not have that in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong U does now require archiving of all research data for new research projects, but the reason is for integrity, not for sharing. So although it enables sharing, it is not required. We also have a problem that some academics are very naive. For example, they assume that DNA data after anonymization can be freely shared. But clearly, you can re-identify people from DNA data. So what's our conclusions? So access to data, which was personal data, even after anonymization, requires very careful assessment of the risk of re-identification, as the consequences are often irreversible. Secondly, money is rarely a good reason to restrict access to government data, because the full benefits far outweigh this relatively small income the government is getting, and the costs have already been paid. But this requires willingness to change procedures. Thirdly, the Law Reform Commission consultations are an opportunity for us to revisit these old policies and to increase access and reuse of government data, whether it's fully open or necessarily restricted. Lastly, we may need to re-examine commercial use. As I said, census allows academic use of their data. They are very restrictive as far as commercial use is concerned. So commercial use may lead to great public value. So and we need to be careful, the Facebook scandal shows that academic access is not always safer. This is a link to some additional information. I hope you find it helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Beginshon. Now our researchers and archivists will share with you their projects using open data and professional views relating to open data. May I now invite Professor Victor Lee of the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering to give a presentation on AI and Big Data to advance well-being and society. Professor Lee, please. Good afternoon. So AI is actually a very old research topic. When we say modern AI, it basically dates back to the 1950s. So the question now is, why is it that only in the recent few years, AI becomes so hot? Well, obviously, it's because advancements in computing equipment, advancements in algorithms, to run AI, algorithm, uh, AI uh, uh, models, but perhaps most importantly is the availability of big data which drives the AI models. Okay. Now, at the University of Hong Kong, we have formed a team which use AI and big data to perform research related to important societal problems. One of the problems we looked at is air pollution, for example. And this project is co-led with Dr. Jacqueline Lam, uh, also in the audience. So the Hong Kong AI team, we have been uh, working on this project for about six years. We started in 2013 when we established the Hong Kong U Cambridge Clean Energy and Environment Research Platform. So we work with different departments of Cambridge University and the University of Hong Kong. In 2017, we got the RGC theme-based research project. 
uh, which is a $50 million project on using AI and big data for personalized air pollution monitoring and health management. In 2018, we formed the Hong Kong UK Cambridge AI to Advance Wellbeing Society Research Platform. We also was uh, assigned the strategically oriented research theme on AI by the University of Hong Kong. In 2017, we also established a Hong Kong U Cambridge PhD pathway, which allow Hong Kong U engineering students to go to Cambridge and obtain an MPhil in technology management from the Judge Business School of Cambridge. There are different aspects of AI research. Our focus is ethical and socially beneficial AI. For example, while we also do facial recognition, we do not use facial recognition for surveillance. We use facial recognition to identify whether people are happy, for example, with the air quality. So as I mentioned, we have a theme-based research project. We also got an ITF grant in collaboration with MIT and others, which is on IoT and Smart City. And in the past few years, we have received some awards. For example, we got the Facebook Low Resource Translation Award, which is AI-based machine translation. Uh, we also have a startup, Fennel Labs, which obtained the Hong Kong ICT Grand Award. And then we represented Hong Kong and entered the Asia Pacific ICT Award. And we beat out 22 countries and got the Grand Award at the Epitech. Uh, our company also is the only Hong Kong based startup that got funding from Horizons Ventures. This is a project that I want to share with you and to explain why we believe open data is so important. Air pollution actually has been a major problem in different parts of China. This is a website from the Environmental Protection Department. As you can see, there are 16 air quality monitoring stations in Hong Kong, and it will tell you information on PM 2.5, PM 10, SO2, and so on. Unfortunately, there are only 16 of them. So if you happen to be at the University of Hong Kong right now, or in Wan Chai, or for that matter, in most part of Hong Kong, you don't know what the air quality information is going to be. Because air quality information is very spatially structured. What that means is PM 2.5 may be 50 here, it may be 500, just a few city blocks away. So the fact that I tell you it's very good here doesn't tell you anything about whether it's good where you are located. So how do we solve this problem? The way we solve this problem is by using big data and an AI approach. We divide the city into small grids of size 100 meter by 100 meter. For each grid, we look at the data that is most indicative of air pollution. Think about it. What are such data? Vehicular traffic information, meteorology, whether there's rainfall, temperature, barometric pressure, urban morphology, where the tall buildings are, land use, is it a park, is it a, a school, and so on, right? We use those data as input. We train up our model and output is the estimated air pollution for each of the 100 meter by 100 meter grid. As a result, what we have done is we have transformed the data that is available from the government, EPD, the 16 stations, we will transform it to 110,000 virtual stations. So we can give you air quality information down to the street level. If you tell me which street you are in or on, I know what the PM 2.5 is. Okay. So now I will know what the air quality in Wen Chai is, although there is no monitoring station there. Okay. 
Now, this allows us to do a lot of things. Okay? One of the things that we can do, of course, is we, can, we have developed apps which will tell you how to avoid the areas of bad, day, of bad air. Okay? But today, I want to share with you this particular piece of work which was published last year. And the question is, are the poor exposed to worse air pollution? So this is an issue related to environmental injustice. Okay. Now, as it turned out, many different people have tried to answer this question. Unfortunately, without very fine-grained, geographically fine-grained description of the air quality, you cannot answer this question very well. Okay. We are now able to do so because we've used the big data and the AI approach. So, because with our AI model, we can now estimate geographically fine-grained air quality data, and our geographical unit is the constituency areas of Hong Kong, of which there are 412. Now, fortunately, from the last census, the government does release the data on the average income level, education level, whether you have a professional job, and so on, for each of the 412 constituency areas. So with that, we can come up with something called a social deprivation index. The higher the social deprivation, the worse off you are. Okay? Now, with our AI model, using the proxy data, which, by the way, is also available from the government. For example, the vehicular traffic is from the transport department. The meteorology data is from the Hong Kong Observatory. And obviously, we also rely on data from the EPD. Okay. We did get some data from the lens department, but they have charged us. So we hope that the lens department will be able to give us the data for free. But in fact, we cannot get the most fine-grained data because that would be too expensive. So we only get the uh, sort of coarse grain description of the, from the lens, lens department and something we can afford. But what if they give us the fine grain description for free? That would be great. But anyway, so with the 412 constituency areas, we can calculate the social deprivation index from the census data. With the proxy data and our AI model, we can calculate the air, air pollution index for 412 constituency areas. We map 412 and 412, and we find there is a statistically significant correlation that says that, unfortunately, in Hong Kong, the poorer people are actually exposed to worse air pollution. So this uh, was actually, we had a press release, and it actually created quite a bit of interest. And Within uh, about 48 hours, we have over 30 reports internationally uh, on TV, radio. I was on TV a couple of times and on radio, and also uh, different newspapers. Okay. So it makes us feel that with the big data and the AI technologies, we can answer some question that has not been able to be answered before. Okay, okay so this actually is the graph, one of the graphs. The y-axis is the mean PM2.5 exposure, and this is measured in micrograms per meter cubed. And the x-axis is the different quintiles in which we divide the 412 CAs into five quintiles. Quintile one represents CAs with the lowest proportion of socially deprived people. So quintile one are the most well-to-do. As you move up the quintile, quintile five is the worst to do in terms of social, in terms of income, education level, and so on. So you see that there is a general trend that as you move to those quintile with worse off people, they are breathing worse air. Now there is a little bit of a dip in the middle, okay? Now, this is because in Hong Kong, actually, as it turned out, the rich and the poor actually live very close to each other. <laughs> so in some CAs, you actually have, have rich people and poorer people living right next to each other. But there is statistical significance in our result, okay, as I've said earlier. 
Okay, so this is sort of the, the visualization. Uh, the blue one is the air quality, the darker the color, the worse off the air. The red one is the social deprivation, the darker the color, the worse off you are socially. And you see that there is some correspondence between the dark red and the dark blue. Okay, so if you are more socially deprived, then you are breathing worse air. Okay, now, of course, there are some exceptions. One big exception is Lantau Island. Lantau Island is actually air quality is pretty good, but social deprivation is very high. Okay. You may wonder, well, what are the worst off places in Hong Kong? So these are some of the worst. Okay, so these are some of the worst off areas. The, these are places like Gun Tong, some Shui Po, and uh, parts of Yun Long. Okay. So, as a, so as I've said, so environmental divide does in fact exist in Hong Kong. Okay. So the question of course is, okay, well, so, so these people are worse off, so what are we going to do about it, right? So with the data, we can actually have compensation programs. For example, we, the government will allocate funding so that they can prime more trees, they can make part of the city uh, just for pedestrian, just like what they did in, uh, in Causeway Bay, for example. Okay. If you want more details, this is the paper which was published in ESP. So to conclude, uh, our research team, we champion a lawful interdisciplinary approach, which is engineering driven, evidence based, societal and citizen empowering. So before, you, can, you cannot make very strong argument because there's not enough evidence. But now we have strong evidence. And our work with Cambridge demonstrates the importance of interdisciplinary research, integrating AI, medical science, and social science so as to address important societal problems. And of course, we need data from the government to support our novel interdisciplinary paradigm. And this is, these are the links to, to the websites if you are interested. And if you more, want more details, feel free to email me. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. May I now invite Ms. Pooja Paryani of the Department of Law to give a presentation on this aggregated data and its potential for corrective justice in an age of inequality. Ms. Parani, please. You able to hear me? Yeah. So I'd like to begin with the proposition that we need systemic record keeping, interdepartmental, intergovernmental, cross sector collaboration for reliable data to understand the nature, the prevalence, and the magnitude of inequalities and to understand their interrelationship in terms of what forms a causative factor, a predictive factor or an environmental or societal condition that then contributes to creating a systemic cycle of deprivation and inequality among particular groups uh, in Hong Kong. Data, therefore, is the key to unlocking our understanding to help us quantify and qualify the social justice problems that we face today, but also to inform our policies and design programs that are based on evidence. More broadly, it helps us to visualize aspects that we may not be able to see without such data. We can recognize very specifically the impact of a particular law or set of laws and policies and systems on the lives of people who are subjected to the systems but also how there is variation 
intergroup, but also within groups. So in this sense, disaggregated data, so not just data as a broad metric, but disaggregated data enables us to identify specific sites of disadvantage and marginality, helping us to ask the right questions to address the social problems that we're interested in. For example, how is age or gender, ethnicity, religion, disability, sexual orientation, <coughs> or a combination of these factors impacting the quality of life, the ability to access particular spaces, services, or capacities for performing to our maximum potential in society if our laws and policies are grounded in this commitment to equality of access and non-discrimination on all of the grounds that we've just stated. So disaggregated data enables us to see what we ordinarily would not be able to see and to see it in a very different light. Um, so we have certain assumptions and impressions, but data helps clarify and make those assumptions much more reliable and astute. And that then leads us to recognize the justice gap, right? To make visible what has been invisible, but also to unveil or unravel some of the hidden structural aspects that impact people's access to public services or opportunity. And then that enables us to design and apply our limited resources in a very targeted way to develop specific policies that seek to close that particular gap. So we might have broad brush principles relating to equality um, and non-discrimination, but with disaggregated data, we can go back and monitor our progress and the effectiveness of the solutions that we've designed and to test whether the measures are having the desired impact on particular groups. And with that, we can continue to refine our approaches, our design, and hopefully make efficient use of our limited resources. Of course, the significance of open data isn't just that it's telling us something. What we have in front of us beckons us to ask, what does this data tell us? But what does the data not tell us? And what is the absence of data telling us? The importance, as I said earlier, of disaggreg disaggregated data is that it enables something that is called an intersectional analysis to, and many of you who are scientists in the room, I'm not, but I understand you do multivariate analysis. And that's basically where you pull together different variables to understand what is the strength of impact of any given variable or set of variables on the outcomes that you're looking at. What explains what we see? Uh, and there is an underlying challenge, though, around the ethical uses of data, and John's alluded to some of those. But in the context of minority uh, issues, and I work on minority rights mainly, and particularly the rights of ethnic minorities, there is an ethical concern underlying the use of data and how it's presented because it can have the potential to create uh, a negative impact or stigma in terms of the groups that are represented or seen to be represented in particular ways. And that's why it's very important not only to talk about open data but also ethical collection of data and ethical representation of particular types of data and contextualizing that data properly. So we have a responsibility not just to put material out there, but also share how that material needs to be understood. And I'll share an example of how um, open data that was made available uh, through what we have in Hong Kong enabled me to put some of the data out there into context, but also to learn many things that we perhaps didn't think about or know specifically with respect to um, Hong Kong's ethnic minorities. So broadly, I work, as I said, in the area of minority rights. And um, there's a, a range of issues that I, I deal with in my work, including gender-based violence, um, children, migrant workers, sexual minorities, human trafficking and ethnic minorities, but also within these groupings, I'm looking at gender, uh, ethnicity, race, religion, and age, and how all of that then changes the metric of what you're looking for and what you're looking at, and what these groups need in order to um, have their situations adequately addressed from an equality and justice perspective. So an example, as I said, is 
looking at the work that is um, currently being done on ethnic minorities in Hong Kong, many of you would be aware that there is currently a great deal of momentum around the issues and trying, in trying to recognize and understand some of the challenges faced by this particular community in Hong Kong. And it's been really helpful to have access to a wide range of open data sources to enable me to do this work. Um, although it provides primarily broad brush data, which isn't um, extremely detailed, but is adequately detailed to enable, and increasingly it's been able to enable, uh, it's been able to allow us to do uh, intersectional work. Um, of the nature that I alluded to just now. So it enables a detailed analysis by the different variables that may tell us a story about why certain groups are performing at a particular level in respect of certain areas of life, whether it's education or employment or poverty, uh, and how do these sort of experiences in these different areas of life affect each other, and how do they impact future life prospects for equality uh, or quality of life, but also how they impact then on the next generation and the next generation. So the government has increasingly provided more detailed reports, particularly since 2001, on, uh, in, in the form of its thematic reports on ethnic minorities, and more recently on the Hong Kong Poverty Situation Report uh, on South Asians and Hong Kong. And so the work that I've primarily done is um, bringing together all relevant data from the open sources I just mentioned, but also all available uh, academic research on Hong Kong's ethnic minorities um, that is sort of free to use, um, to disaggregate it and analyze it and to sort of map it against the life trajectory of different ethnic groups in Hong Kong uh, and to examine the differences between various ethnic groups as well. And so you can start to see a very specific story about Hong Kong's ethnic minorities. Some ways, in some ways, the story here about racial minorities matches or maps quite um, clearly onto the global trends that we see in terms of uh, minority population groups, uh, whether you're talking about the UK or the US or Australia or Canada. But then there are, of course, specific uh, differences with respect to how these patterns manifest in Hong Kong and which groups are the worst off in this particular, question, uh, in this particular context, which forces us to ask, well, where do those differences stem from? And why are those groups targeted or singled out um, through the system, not necessarily deliberately. But there's a combination of factors that is unveiled uh, as we were able to do this particular analysis. So I just want to say at the outset as well, um, you know, so the Status of Ethnic Minorities Report uh, tried to gather sort of the, um, the analysis uh, looking at sort of the post-1997 situation um, because there were a range of changes in policy, so I wanted to capture that. But what it's done is by putting everything in one space and providing a mapping across sort of um, these different areas of life and stages, um, it's enabled policymakers, legislators, um, teachers, um, uh, government officials as well, NGO colleagues to draw on this and to use it as a conversation starter. Because Hong Kong has had um, a historical problem in addressing its own race discrimination challenge. Uh, we started out in the 80s and early 90s with a great deal of denial around whether there even was a problem relating to race in Hong Kong. And a lot of that um, stemmed perhaps from the fact that we uh, were a colony and a lot of the policies that were in place weren't um, things that were created by the Hong Kong government that we have today. But the report enables us to speak to and to confront these issues because now there is data and there are statistics which basically call for an explanation. So if it's not race, then why is it that the system seems to um, be ineffective in enhancing access and opportunities for particular groups. So what have we been able to do with this data and how has it helped us better understand um, the challenges and how has it impacted policies? So for example, disaggregated data enabled us to see through intersectional analysis that um, ethnic minority populations tend to be younger compared with the general population in Hong Kong on average. And that may lead to um, a policy recommendation that we ought to invest more extensively in ethnic minority youth today because they're going to be the responding sort of um, 
uh, the responding age groups, uh, when our elderly population comes of age, or, or they're going to be the ones who are going to be participating more actively, or should be participating more actively in the workforce. So we have that. And we can also see from this that this group is more productive in terms of births. There's also interesting things happening if you disaggregate the data by gender, age, and ethnicity and put it all together to see what the intersectional analysis tells you there. We see that there are wide sex ratio disparities in some groups in particular. And if you focus um, on, for example, the Pakistani community, you can see that the yellow line represents all those age 65 and above. So the male to female ratio is 1 to 14,000 in that age category. And then, of course, you can look at the other bar, which is um, also quite significant, um, the Japanese, and then the Caucasian population, and the other mixed category. So you start to see that there are different things happening in different groups. And at first blush, you might write off the Pakistani figure as something to do with culture or religion. But then you realize, well, there are other groups that are behaving in a similar way. And you might ask, is that to do with labor importation schemes? How come there are these missing women uh, in terms of um, sort of that age group? And what does that tell us about the mental or physical health issues and challenges that our senior males in Hong Kong will face, right, with, um, in terms of their family unit and their lifestyle? We also learned, for example, that Hong Kong's education system doesn't seem to work um, to enhance um, equality of educational opportunities for ethnic minorities. Disaggregated by uh, age and by ethnicity, we see ethnic minority children are starting school later, they're dropping out of school earlier, and they're less likely to enter into post-secondary education. There are a lot of barriers that have been identified, but the studies, again, pulled together, help us put this data into context. Particular groups are more likely to fall into these patterns. They're the uh, Filipina, the Nepalese, and the Pakistani community. So the question is, well, why them? And the answer to that comes when you look at the poverty figures. But just before I jump to poverty, we see that with this, if you further disaggregate by um, special education needs or disability, we now know that among ethnic minority children, 57% of special education needs drop out of primary school and never make it to secondary, compared with 5% of the general population. Uh, of children who are special education needs kids. So that's a huge dropout rate. And what that told us is that there's a, a gap in the public sector schools which are not providing education in English to non-Chinese speaking um, children with special, ed special education needs. And that formed the basis of a policy recommendation for the Education Bureau to look at so that they can target their resources accordingly. These are the figures relating to who received post-secondary education um, by ethnicity. And again, you could see a lot of variation across the groups, and you can almost sort of put it uh, in, a, in a hierarchy, and you can compare it with the general population of Hong Kong. And broadly speaking, we learned through this mapping that Chinese as a language remains the primary barrier. And that explains a lot of the um, lack of access in many of these spaces. Um, lack of Chinese proficiency on the part of the children, obviously, but particularly the family context, the lack of um, opportunity for exposure and practice as well, tends to impact admission rates and the through train effect uh, all the way through to university. Labor force participation, if you break that down by gender, age, and ethnicity, you can again see who's most active and who's least active. The green line, you can see um, Pakistani women tend to be least active in the labor force um, in, in this particular year. So I think this was, res was with respect to 2011. Um, and the general population is the red line above, and everybody else is below. But you can see different things are happening with particular ethnic groups here. Um, there's a child poverty problem among ethnic minority communities, but also in particular, so one in three children are likely to be living below um, the poverty line um, among ethnic minority children. And for particular two specific groups, the Nepalese and the Pakistanis, one in two are potentially living below, um, po uh, below poverty. And of course, with different interventions, there are changes now occurring with these figures, but there is an intergenerational effect. And if you go back to the education data, you can start to see that those are the children who are most likely to drop out of school early. And the reason they're dropping out is not because, as some of the narrative used to be, I'm glad to say it's not so much so anymore, but the narrative used to be ethnic minority children are not very bright, they're quite lazy, 
or their parents are not committed to their education, they don't believe in education as the future, that narrative has now changed because now we know why. Perhaps the parents need the extra hands to work so that they can earn an income because those families tend to be larger, but also they're already living in poverty. And then there are a lot of other challenges that may preclude them from participating in the typical trajectory of a Hong Kong youth um, to get through the education system. So household sizes are important. And you know the bigger household sizes, for example, have a lower, um, have a disproportionately lower income, and that comes down to what are the occupations that ethnic minorities uh, find themselves in. So again, if you look at that data by gender and by ethnicity, you can see that the majority of ethnic, mi particular ethnic minority groups, are um, in manual or unskilled labor occupations compared with um, the general population, and specific education, uh, ethnic minority groups tend to do better um, or are in sort of higher end um, professional groups. And that is also explained by their participation um, in different stages of education. So this disaggregated data then and the intersectional uh, sort of framework I was able to develop around it enabled sort of a very dis uh, distinct and specific view of the disparate impact of um, education policy, but also media instruction policies uh, on ethnic minorities and the critical lack of equality in different domains. Um, the book itself has chapters on health, employment, poverty, education, um, uh, discrimination, experiences of discrimination, law enforcement. And so that sort of forces people who are working in these um, areas, but also on the front line, to challenge the traditional frames of understanding the problem that we think we have. So we might think, oh, you know, Hong Kong's ethnic minority problem is the result of most of them being immigrants coming here and then they can't integrate. But that's not the problem. These are also part of families who have been here for some time and they continue to experience these problems. And so there, you know, it's a much more complex picture and this type of analysis enables us to see that. And that also challenges the status quo that, you know, just because we have equalities of guarantee, uh, guarantees of equality in the law, that therefore everything should in good time be corrected. But I think that this analysis reveals that corrective justice can only happen if you undertake very specific um, changes. And I'm glad that this report has then led to a series of conversations with relevant people across um, the community, including um, government bureau uh, officials, but all the way uh, right through to Mrs. Carrie Lam when she was chief secretary, to whom we presented these um, findings and recommendations. And we can see the effects of some of that uh, coming out now as a result of various um, steps that have been taken in response to this research. So for example, we now have a high level body such as the Steering Committee on Ethnic Minority Affairs, which now looks uh, from a macro level, looks at the policies and issues uh, affecting ethnic minorities. And then there are also micro level committees. Um, so we know that the poverty uh, commission, for example, was set up, and one of the groups that it was looking at was um, special needs groups, including ethnic minorities as well. LegCo subcommittees have examined a range of these issues that have come up since the 2015 report, um, and then the framework is increasingly being utilized with um, NGO practitioners challenging the government to um, address uh, or provide um, resources to target specific groups that fall um, you know, in, across multiple um, areas of vulnerability or marginality, such as children or ethnic minority women. It's also helped raise the public awareness around these issues and prompted a review and reassessment of our laws. And most importantly, I think for this particular audience, it's also opened up many other spaces uh, for asking questions about what else we could do with data like this and what other areas of research need to be done to help us enhance further our understanding of many of these challenges. So we couldn't, you know, we can't fix a problem if we can't see the problem and if we can't see it accurately. And increasingly open and disaggregated data carries this potential to help us develop innovative and um, interdisciplinary solutions to social justice problems that unfortunately continue to plague um, the world more broadly, but are still part not only of our history, but also of our present. So I hope that that would encourage us to do more along these lines. And uh, I welcome the steps that the government and others are taking, and I hope that we can work collaboratively to do more of this sort of work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parani. 
May I now invite Dr. Wilson Liu of the Department of Real Estate and Construction to give a presentation on Finding the Needles in a Haystack, Identification of Illegal Dumping of Construction Waste Using Urban Big Data. Dr. Liu, please. Thank you. So the topic uh, of my talk today is about uh, identifying the illegal dumping of construction waste using uh, big data. I just uh, secured this project from uh, uh, public policy research to fund it. Uh, and doing that with my uh, collaborator, uh, uh, research assistant professor, uh, Frank Shea, who is also sitting in the audience. But anyway, so uh, before I introduce how to do that, I, I would like to uh, uh, talk a bit more about the uh, lab and actually leading. The lab I'm uh, trying to do is called iLab. It's basically a, an urban big data lab. So, so uh, it is housed in the uh, uh, seventh floor uh, of the Nose building. So next time, if you have time, please come to visit my lab. So uh, basically, it is a, it's a, a dat uh, urban big data collection, storage, uh, analysis, and visualization to support decision making in smart city development. Uh, it collects data from different sources, like a GIS data, like a GPS, or BIM, or remote sensing, or some other uh, data sources. Uh, so we aim to use uh, our lab as the, uh, to support the uh, uh, research in other labs. Uh, in the meantime, actually, the la lab also has its own uh, unique research ring. For example, one of my uh, current uh, research uh, uh, projects is to try to develop an urban digital twin. Um, so actually, major cities around the world, like New York, like London, uh, uh, Singapore, or, or Berlin, are trying to develop some their city-level city uh, digital models. Hong Kong uh, has no exception. Actually, recently, Hong Kong released the, a new version of uh, 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 digital model. Um, my professor in, in Stanford University, when he uh, uh, read this article, he immediately sent me an email saying, oh, this is something very encouraging. Um, yes, but basically, I'm not very happy with all the uh, works now uh, that major cities are doing, because if you look at the uh, uh, um, city models, basically they are uh, they have very limited information. Um, for example, the buildings are represented as blocks, uh, rows are represented as essential lines. So in our turn, actually the model has limited semantics. Okay? Uh, in addition, the city model is not machine readable. We can easily tell that is a building, that is a bridge. But uh, talking about smart city, you, you, you need to use uh, machine, use a computer. So make sure the, the model uh, is machine readable. So to try to uh, enrich the semantics uh, using the manual efforts as possible, but this is extremely uh, time consuming. So you annotate this is a window, that has a water tank, and this is also very tedious. Okay, I can imagine this is a, a terrible job okay, if you ask you to do, to do that manually. So because this is a, as a city level, so we have to use AI or use an uh, algorithm to do this, okay, to develop a semantic, uh, rich uh, 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 digital model. So um, we, we start from the digital twin uh, from uh, 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 level one. We, we have a term called the level of detail to define this kind of uh, 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 urban digital twin. So we purchase the uh, data from the lens department. I must say this is good stuff, okay? Very good detail uh, data, but uh, I'm not sure whether this is the data uh, that Professor Lee is seeking for lens department. It's quite pricey, okay? So if it is a, the data you want to come, we share the data with you, but if it's not, let's organize together to, to, to bargain with the uh, lens department to get the data. Okay, so with the IB1000 data, it's possible to develop the level one, uh, LOD1 uh, uh, city model. Um, but we, again, I, 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 I want to uh, develop more details. So, for example, we, we developed the rooftop. Uh, rooftop. 
So uh, I, I, I searched around, back in Hong Kong, we don't have this kind of data. But only uh, CEDD, I'm not sure whether CEDD has a representative here today. Uh, I, I dropped an email say, oh, is that possible to provide the, the rooftop uh, data? Uh, actually, they are very generous. They said, no problem, we can give you for research purpose. Uh, so I got the data uh, for free, okay, which is lucky. But the, 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 the thing is, that actually, the data was scanned in 2010 and 2011. A lot of things have changed ever since. So, um, but for some other cities, like Dublin, they now provide very uh, higher uh, dense density data uh, for, uh, for free download, actually. I'm not sure whether in Hong Kong, uh, next step, we can, we can uh, try to make up this part of data. So uh, using the uh, CEDD data, we, can, uh, we are able to detail the rooftop. Okay? So for different purposes, for example, some of my colleagues are trying to uh, predict the green roof okay, of uh, green roof in Hong Kong. So because in Hong Kong, uh, when you try to uh, build a green roof, you don't have to uh, 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 seek the uh, building's permit from the depa uh, uh, department. So it's, it's, it's critical to know where the, all the green roofs are. So uh, another colleague of mine is trying to develop something very interesting. He called that edible roof. Okay, trying to use the rooftop to develop some urban farming. Okay, we Hong Kong, uh, we, we don't really want small potatoes, tomatoes, but it just provide a, a community. Okay, a, com a, a social community for us or for the aged people. Okay, to have a, a, a way to communicate with each other. So also uh, a lot of uh, uh, improper use of the rooftops. For example, is to use the unauthorized building works. So it is critical to, to have the details of all Hong Kong's rooftops. Okay? Sometimes there's, there's a water tank there, sometimes there's a, uh, a, a satellite dish there. You cannot use that part. So if you really want to use the rooftop, you have to have the details. I'm not sure, perhaps, uh, 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 Professor Lee, again, your index can be verified with say, some uh, like uh, unauthorized uh, building works on the rooftop. If there's a lot of unauthorized work, perhaps they say for slants or for some other purposes, we can work on that. Okay, then, uh, some of my colleagues uh, are also doing something interesting, use the data like uh, uh, to try to see, to, to, to improve the workability in Hong Kong. Um, my other colleagues uh, are trying to use Okay, the, uh, the data to, to try to do the uh, urban planning. Uh, my team is, is also uh, trying to further detail the uh, urban digital twin from level one to three, uh, to two, to three, to four. Okay? So I don't have time to, to elaborate all the uh, AI algorithms here, but I can say this uh, is quite uh, interesting. And both projects have been funded by Research Grant Council. Now, I'm talking about uh, uh, construction waste management, illegal dumping. So, um, in Hong Kong, uh, construction waste, normally we divide construction waste into two types. Okay? One is the inert part, okay? another type is the long inert part. Inert part, okay, like uh, uh, debris, rubble, earth, and the concrete, actually can be reused okay, as uh, uh, aggregates or some other things. Uh, long inert part, Okay, so, so, so basically organic must be landfilled. I can provide you a little statistics. Okay, uh, among all the construction waste generated, this long inner part is only around 5%. Okay, that means the rest, 95%, is inert. Okay? We have to landfill the, the uh, long inner part, but that 5% actually consumes one quarter of all the landfill space in Hong Kong. So we must have to, we must okay, deal with this part uh, uh, critically. In Hong Kong, okay, since 2006, actually we, have, we had a, a construction waste disposal charging scheme. So if you want to dispose a ton of construction waste in different government facilities, you have to pay for it. 
Okay. They upgrade the, the price in 2000, uh, 2017. So there is an incentive that for some of the, I don't know, contractors, developers, or, or lorry drivers to dump the construction waste in somewhere rather than the government facilities so they can save money, okay? save chips, save time. So that is the illegal dumping. Uh, so my research, so this is an interesting, I'm sure you know this, this is a, is a, is a illegal dumping uh, 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 mountain in new territories somewhere. Okay? This is the case in Shenzhen. So the landslide actually destroyed 33 buildings and making uh, more than 70 people disappear. So this part, the illegal dumping part, we must uh, look at that seriously. Okay, the interesting audits commission, audit, auditor uh, published a, a report in 2016. That report is quite interesting. And if you, you read them, you, you will know a lot of interesting things about uh, illegal dumping and the construction waste management behind. Uh, my task okay, is trying to identify the illegal dumping case. It's basically urban, uh, uh, urban crime, okay? urban criminal things. So uh, I use this to, this is Hong Kong, okay? In Hong Kong every day, uh, there are a lot of construction works going on. So uh, lorry drivers, the trucks, they have to dis transport the construction waste and uh, dispose of them in different facilities. So basically, we have uh, three types of facilities. This is called landfill, okay? Basically for uh, 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 long inlet or, uh, construction waste. And then you have a public field reception can accept in that construction waste for future years, for example. And they, in Hong Kong, normally we, uh, we have very congested construction site and the construction labor cost is higher. So if you don't have time to sort the waste, okay, sort the construction uh, in that from the long in that part, you can send the uh, mixture of the construction waste to these facilities. But interesting, so every, for every load of construction waste uh, disposed in the government uh, facilities, actually you have a record left there. Okay, you have a record, like the transaction date, what kind of vehicle transport that. So for privacy, they actually hide one of the numbers, but you can easily recover that. So, okay, so that's the uh, uh, big thing about big data, right? So you have an account number, you have all sorts of data. So actually, each year, you have more than one million records of this kind. So that actually forms the big data of construction waste generation in Hong Kong. All right? So, uh, so like uh, six or seven years ago, I hired a student, uh, RA, to, to, to uh, they, they just call the uh, EPD, and they're interesting. At that time, uh, big data was not popular. So they didn't wear the value, so they gave me the, the data. So I didn't pay for anything, Dr. Uh, Professor Lee. So if you look at this, it says uh, facility information, open data, you have all the open data there. But there's only one critical missing uh, jigsaw piece. That is the data about the, all the construction sites. So actually, who is the client, okay? What kind of, uh, 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 what is the uh, GFA, what is the contract sign, what is the construction period of the, this? So uh, with that, without the uh, uh, piece, I actually cannot form a, a, true, a whole story. So again, I asked my student uh, to approach them, uh, and at that time, I was given the data. So I didn't pay anything for that. But now, okay, because I, this database is updating gradually, now when I approach uh, EPD, nobody replies to me. So I hope this, <laughs> uh, you can help me again, EPD can help me to, to uh, uh, identify the data. So uh, I use a lot of data cleansing, do a lot of linkage, and I'm trying to put all the pieces together to try to identify the illegal dumping from this big data. Don't believe this. This is not true, okay? This is just, <laughs> this is true. Okay, so uh, I actually uh, uh, divided the task into three, three steps. The first step is to try to understand the illegal dumping, okay? So trying to understand why there's a behavior 
and then uh, have a set of uh, uh, indicators. And then the second step is to develop an analytic ba uh, model based on the identified indicators. And then the third step is to try to chain and calibrate the model using known offense cases. Okay, this is again critical. So I, I need to uh, identify some offense cases and try to identify the characteristics. But I, whatever I tried, I can only find a short video on the on the on the internet, and I identify the five uh, cases. So I can do the pilot test. Now I'm desperately looking for the some other offense cases. Okay, I I understand EPD has the data because they installed the surveillance camera in some uh, transport uh, black uh, ports. But they said, Dr. Lu, I cannot give the data. It's privacy data. So I talked to some lawyers. They said, oh, might, might I have some uh, 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 case description in this website? So I searched and searched. I cannot find the data. So actually, some people <laughs> recommend me to sit in the court. Uh, but these are normally very small cases. So they only announce the day ahead. So I cannot really plan my trip. Uh, I also wrote to uh, Zimmerman. He said, "Wilson, probably you don't have to. You have to ambush yourself and try to shoot a cam uh, shoot the offense cases." But I, some other people say the people will beat me. So for my safety, I'm, I'm yet to do that. But I, I just uh, uh, and and desperately uh, looking for some other data source to change my AI model. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Liu. May I now invite Dr. Tommy Lam of the School of Public Health to give a presentation on Open Genomic Data for Studying Infectious Diseases. Dr. Lam, please. So the genomic uh, sequence of, uh, is basically uh, an uh, ID for any organisms. And same for the microorganisms, uh, for viruses, bacteria, we can use the, their genomic data to dis distinguish them. And um, so, so many, many of the uh, laboratory and hospital has been using the uh, genomic uh, techniques to uh, determine the pathogens genomes from their patient samples to, uh, to, uh, for disease diagnosis. And we can also predict the uh, pathogens phenotypes and uh, the res their response to the uh, treatment uh, by looking at uh, their genomes to, uh, for uh, some known uh, mutations. And um, at population level, uh, if there is some outbreak, we can also use the genomic data to track the source of the infections and also how the pathogens spread uh, across the populations uh, to get better understanding of the disease uh, dynamics and the factors driving the uh, disease emergence. And my talk will uh, focus on this topic. So the Western of uh, using the genomic data to study transmission is, is that the transmission history is indeed imprinted in the uh, pathogen genomes. So in the infections, the, uh, the pathogens replicate, uh, mutations occur, and uh, some of the mutants will transmit to the next patients. And um, the mutations, therefore, uh, accumulate along the transmission chain. And if we sample some of the patients, uh, sequence the pathogen genomes, we can uh, determine their evolutionary history between different pathogen genomes by using, for example, phylogenetic uh, uh, analysis techniques. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the evolutionary relationship between different pathogens uh, from different samples uh, basically capture the transmission history. And so this is based on the mutation uh, uh, that accumulate along the transmission chain. And so furthermore, if we can uh, map the, uh, the evolutionary tree on the 
uh, on the map, on the groups, then we can also track the dissemination of the pathogens uh, in the geographical uh, dimension. So, when we uh, when we when we when we are working with the uh, disease uh, data, uh, very often we it come with the geospatial information, and we can uh, use that information to identify the cluster infections, to uh, to identify the associated uh, environmental risk factor. Um, but for uh, infectious disease uh, control, we are also very interested to, uh, to, to what extent the, the, the pathogens spread across uh, geographical distance. And based on just the uh, case data uh, and also the geographical information cannot give us this information. So the, the transmission language between the infections can actually be learned from the evolution history of the pathogens' uh, genomes, so the, which can be determined by the phylogenetic analysis, for example. And because we can estimate the ancestral locations uh, of, of these pathogens in the phylogenetic tree, in the uh, emergent history, we can track the movement of the pathogen's lineage uh, in the history of emergence. Of course, this requires uh, some uh, mathematical modelings and also uh, 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 specialists in that field. Um, and uh, in addition to the, uh, the microbiologists uh, working on the bench that generate the sequence data. And so this required multidisciplinary co uh, collaborations um, uh, in order to study that. So now I am going to give you an example of such analysis uh, to, to shade in, uh, light into the origin of the pandemic uh, influenza uh, uh, happens in 2009. So I think some of you may still remember in 2009, April, there's a novel influenza outbreak uh, occurred in the United States, and then the, the virus soon spread to uh, all over the world within months. And this is so-called the swine flu pandemic. Many of the laboratory uh, sequenced the virus uh, for disease diagnosis and also distinguish uh, the virus to, uh, from the other virus. And these data uh, were then disposed to the public database for open use. So a team uh, analyzed uh, about 200 uh, sequences of that uh, virus. Uh, using some uh, model that I just mentioned um, to reconstruct the disease emergence and the spread process. And so this video shows the reconstruction of the disease emergence and spread uh, across the world. So you will estimate that the virus was first in, uh, emerged in Mexico and then it spread to uh, United States and other parts of the world, despite the fact that the, 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 the first infections was reported in the uh, United States. And it also shows that uh, uh, Mexico uh, played a major, uh, quite major role in disseminating the uh, virus to other parts of the world, in addition to uh, United States in the early of the uh, outbreak. So another example of using genomic data to understand the sp uh, spread of the uh, infectious disease uh, is from my previous research on H5N1 avian influenza. So it is a highly pathogenic uh, uh, virus emerged in China in uh, 1996. And uh, it killed birds rapidly and as well as human, as I think most of you remember the outbreak in Hong Kong in 1997. And the virus uh, soon spread to Southeast Asia, including Indonesia in 2003. Uh, in, in, in there, of course, it caused big economic and health uh, burden. And I was studying uh, where it was first introduced in the uh, country and how it spread across the, uh, the land. 
So I analyzed uh, 200, about 200 uh, Indonesian H5N1 avian influenza virus sequence that are available in the public database. And uh, to construct the evolution history as well as the transmission history of the, uh, uh, of the virus. And I was find that the virus was first introduced into the Java Island, persist there, and then spread to other uh, island, Ocean only. So then I move on to uh, investigate uh, how the, uh, the virus spread within the Java Island. So I uh, apply some uh, model that I just mentioned to reconstruct the emergent history and the spread uh, and the sp spatial spread of the uh, pathogens uh, in the spatial scale. So here, this is the reconstructions, and the, the introductions was first uh, was estimated to be in the uh, central driver, and then instead of staying there, expanding uh, the the virus vessel 4, which is uh, indicated by the red dots, actually move right and left to uh, across the island. And so this unstable virus vessel 4 can actually be the target for more effective disease control. And the analysis also suggests the virus is moving pretty fast, about six uh, kilometer per week. So, these uh, examples uh, demonstrate that the use of the genomic data can help to understand how the disease uh, spread across the community, as well as uh, uh, what insight that can be gained from these to, uh, uh, to, to control the disease. And, um, and many of the uh, many of the laboratories have already been using the genomic sequencing techniques to generate the sequence data from the, from the pathogens. And many of, in many cases, they dump the sequence data to the public database. And then uh, some other uh, uh, scientists, they will then uh, collect the data and then do some further anal an analysis. And so this helped to uh, encourage the uh, interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, and more full use of data. And so by, by uh, releasing the uh, genomic data of pathogens to, uh, for public use actually allows uh, massive analysis at the same time by different uh, expert, uh, experts. For taking uh, the smile flu pandemic as an example, when the first virus gene released uh, uh, in April 2009, many scientists uh, go to download and then uh, do the analysis and publish some interesting findings in the personal blogs within days. And uh, some of these are also uh, published uh, in uh, peer-reviewed journals. And uh, this allow this early timely uh, findings allow us to understand the disease better in the early uh, phase of the outbreak. And also the more the data, uh, the more complete and powerful the analysis is. Some, uh, the data from these regions may be also important, the data for the, for the uh, other regions. So it's, it's some argument to say it's important to, uh, uh, to share the genomic data of the pathogens uh, affecting uh, certain regions to the world. Um, so in my experience, there are actually some uh, pathogen genome sequence uh, in the public database published by Hong Kong government laboratories. But I'm not sure whether all of such data are open. And the, the, uh, how fast the, the, um, the data are released is also critical because the timing analysis will be key for disease uh, control and prevention. And I think uh, the pathogen genomic data is less sensitive in terms of uh, privacy issue, and the hurdle should be lower uh, for release, uh, for open use. Um, taking uh, the dengue outbreak uh, last year in Hong Kong example, with the dengue uh, virus genome sequences from Hong Kong in the past in the outbreak, as well as uh, from other part of the world, we can use the analysis to determine whether there are local transmissions or foreign introductions. And uh, if introductions from other place, where are they, where they are from? And if 
local transmissions, what are the time that the transmissions uh, start? Which all this information are uh, important for uh, managing the disease outbreak. So uh, here's some uh, links for further information about the research that I present. And I really look forward to more uh, uh, genomic data open from the uh, uh, release from the governments, Hong Kong governments, to, uh, to allow more uh, interdisciplinary analysis uh, for a healthier city in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lam. May I now invite Mr. Stacy Belcher Lee of the University Archives to give a presentation on the archivist and access, custodian and guide, not gatekeeper. Mrs. Lee, please. Hey. Hey. I'm so glad not to be on crutches this week. This is a first in five weeks. I'm, I feel like running around the stage. Um, I've, I've been told we're running a bit over, so I'm going to try to, to keep to this brutally short time period. And um, so if there's anything that you see today on the slides or that you hear me say that you don't understand, my contact information is on the Hong Kong U web pages. Call me. Send me an email. You know, I'd be happy to, to talk with you. Um, I'm the first person up here today who's going to talk about the other side of open data from the side of the suppliers and not from the side of the users or researchers, okay? Now, let me make it perfectly clear. Archivists are not the only <coughs> suppliers of open data. Um, much of the open data is still uh, to be found within corporations or within uh, government offices, bureaus, departments, whatever. So my view is not the whole view, okay? But because I've spent much of my life um, as a provider of records for other people's research, I think that, that um, it might be interesting for you to hear that side of it. OK? Um, first of all, these are sort of some of the questions I want to talk about today. I realize that there are many people here in the audience who are quite well aware of what an archivist is but I, uh, and what arch archivists do. But I have also been absolutely gobsmacked by the amount of people I run into who don't. OK? So quickly, for those of you who don't, I'm going to run through that at the beginning. But the, but the slides that I really want you to focus on today um, to get an idea of what the archivist's um, uh, core values and code of ethics, what that leads us to, pr to promote as part of our profession, will be slides like 6 through 10, OK? And then the last, links. So if you want to have a little sleep now, it's fine. OK. So, um, so these are the questions I'm going to touch on today. And um, the first one. Um, what are archives? You know, I hear people use archives as a verb all the time now. Oh, I'm going to archive that. And what they mean is to store. That's a very tiny part of what an archivist does, okay? Um, so when an archivist uses the word, and these, these uh, definitions are taken from the Society of American Archivists web pages, in case you're wondering. Um, we usually use it in one of three ways. The word archives, with a, all lowercase, means the collection itself. This is the archive of X, Mr. X, or Company C, or Government A, right? And it refers to the records that are kept because they have continuing value to the creating agency and to other potential users, right? Like users of big data. Sometimes these records include big data. And they are the facts that we use to interpret and understand history because they're documentary evidence, OK? They are primary sources, OK? Um, you would be amazed at what a small percentage of the records we create in any given organization, business, government, you know, church, NGO, whatever. You would be amazed at the tiny, tiny percentage of the whole that we actually keep for the archives. Most of my job as an archivist is appraisal. I tell you what to throw out and when to throw it out because we don't want it in the archives, because we cannot possibly keep all of the stuff that we generate in a given year at Hong Kong U or in the HKSAR or at HSBC or in any of the archives here in Hong Kong. 
or anywhere in the world. So secondly, an archive's often written with a capital A, and we almost always say archives. We hardly ever say archive. I don't know how that happened, but it's just the way it is. Um, it's an organization. So here's the collections. This is the organization dedicated to preserving the documentary heritage of a particular group. And that can be a government, a business, um, a school, um, a hospital. It's generally an organization, OK? When we have what we would think of as an archive or a collection from an individual, we tend to refer to that as personal papers or manuscripts, depending on the nature of that personal collection. Many of those things end up in archives with a capital A, but generally we tend to be related to big organizations, OK? And then finally, the third way professionals use the word archives is the building itself. I'm going to the archives in Quintong, right? I'm going to the public records office. The archive means the building. So archivists, what are we? What do we do with our time? Um, we are the people who collect and from, well, first we make the decision about what to collect. So that is assessment or appraisal. Then we collect, we organize, um, we preserve, and we provide access. And providing the access ties back to the organize. Because it's during processing these collections that we create arrangement and description for them. And unlike in a library where you have an artificial organization of arrangement, right, like the Dewey Decimal System or the online catalog Library of Congress system that organizes published materials according to certain criteria, like title, author, subject, an archive is actually an organic representation of that which created it. All right? So archivists organize things according to the creator to the department or bureau that it came from, right? to the person that collected it. So when you go into an archive, you're going to need a little bit more help from the archivist to, to get to what you need than you would if you walk into a library where that artificial system's already set out for you and you already understand about it because you've been going to libraries for a long time. OK? So archivists, we are a profession, like being a lawyer or an engineer or um, you know, a dentist or whatever. And so we have professional positions that we require um, of our members to adhere to national and international standards of practice and in accordance with a professional code of ethics. Um, and this statement, the majority of professional archivists hold a baccalaureate degree and many may have, I think that's actually a bit outdated. I haven't met a professional archivist in more than a decade who doesn't have one or more master's degrees, possibly a doctorate, and it is now a requirement even in order to sit and take the test to become a member of the academy to have two years of professional experience and at least one master's degree. So that sort of tells you a little bit about what we are. Um, one of the things that I think it's really important to touch on here is archivists don't work in a vacuum. None of us do, right? And, this, and the two professions that we are most closely related to right now are records managers. In fact, some of us uh, often, in the case of universities, also act as the records managers for our organizations. Within the Hong Kong government, the archives is a part of the government records service, right? And the other profession that we work quite closely with now is IT. The reason for that is, is um, well, it's multifold, but we um, work with records management during the life cycle of the records to help them determine what goes and what stays how records are classified and scheduled, how we build retention schedules, when things can be safely destroyed, and what ultimately will end up in the archives, all right? In a sense, archives and records management, and that's the way it's referred to in many graduate schools, ARM, that's a single profession. In some countries, it's seen as two, but worldwide, it tends to be seen as a single profession. 
And then the second thing I wanted to mention is IT. And it's because of this. Increasingly, records managers and archivists work with electronic records. And that necessitates us being, becoming familiar with um, uh, digital record keeping and what that entails. And that we work in tandem with those departments within our business or our government or wherever it is we're being an archivist to bring all, all of those groups' expertise to bear on the problems of creating, preserving, and providing access to digital records. And here's the scoop. In the beginning of the digital age, we worked with, with um, records that were hard copy and then were digitized. Now almost everything is born digital. And the lifespan of the record has become the concern of the archivist from the get-go. We no longer can sit and wait it has to be done from the planning period from the minute those records were born. So, um, hiya. Okay. Um, preservation and use, very simply. There is no point in saving things if you are not going to use them. That's almost the sum of my profession. There is no point in saving it if you're not going to use it. So, Hence the weeding and the appraisal and the trying to decide, okay, we have a limited amount of money, space, time, and staff. What are we going to save? And when an archivist talks about preserving things, we're not talking about the next 10 years. You may have noticed tonight, every single person using data referred to, oh, well, this is old. This is from 10 years ago, and I need the more newer data. That is not how an archivist thinks. The archivist is thinking all the time, oh my god, how am I going to preserve this electronic data for the next 100, 200, 500 years? OK? So we have some problems with that, and I mentioned it at the bottom. Electronic records are inherently unstable, because they're electromagnetic. They're not easy to authenticate. They're difficult to secure. And they're really, really expensive to preserve over long periods of time, as opposed to hard copy. But those are problems that the archives profession as a whole has been working on for a long time now, like since before the invention of the internet. OK. Whoops. Ah! I went too far. Um, so I'm going to. Um, say one thing, too, about that. Digitizing stuff is, it does help us preserve the originals when the originals are hard copy, because it allows us to boing, send that information out over the net. People can use it, never look at the originals, never have to touch them. But the digital images themselves are not the preservation. It's the fact that they're keeping you from using the other stuff. So. Um, I would strongly recommend, and I have the links at the end of this talk, that you take a good look at the Society of American Archivists um, website um, and also the International Council on Archives website if you'd like to know more about our profession as providers of, of records or purveyors of records. Um, but I think I can sum the core values of archivists and also um, our code of ethics by pointing out just one thing on each page. Although access may be limited in some instances, archivists seek to promote open access and use when possible. That's our whole deal. We want to make it available. We want to make it available as fast as we can to as many people as we can in as equitable a manner as possible. And that means I don't ask you who you are and what you're going to do with the records. If you have proper ID and you show up in my archives, if it's open, it's open to you. It's not open because of who you know or what you're going to do with the records. I don't make value judgments like that. It's either open or it's closed. And if it's closed, it's closed because it would be in violation of the law to open it at that time. I do not keep records in the archives that cannot ever be opened would be pointless, wouldn't it? Eventually, it will be open, and we like to have a finite date about that when we take them in. 
okay? And the code of ethics here says, recognizing that use is the fundamental reason for keeping archives, archivists actively promote open and equitable access to records in their care within the context of their institution's mission and their intended user groups. They minimize restrictions, they maximize ease of access, they facilitate the continuing accessibility and intelligibility of archival materials in all formats. Just like the law equally applies to a record, a record is a record is a record, whether it's hard copy or an electronic format, we want to keep things available as long as we possibly can to as many people as we can in whatever format it was born in. Okay, so um, many of you know that I'm uh, a member, although today I'm not re representing the subcommittee, a member of the subcommittee on archives law for the Law Reform Commission. And you may also know that I work as a member of the um, governing board for the um, section on university and research institute archives for the International Council on Archives. Here's the scoop. I'm, I'm gung-ho about both the archives and the access law as a, my personal opinion, as a professional archivist. I think it will help to support all of my fellow archivists in their profession. I think it will support and promote open data and open records of all kinds. The sooner the better. Um, it will, as I've said, um, give us a framework and a more successful approach to having good archives and records management practices. And even though the laws that w the subcommittees are looking at apply only to government records, I can tell you from past experience from working with my British counterparts when they were adopting their first, um, their first um, access law and uh, reworking their archives law in Britain around the turn of the last century, it will make a huge difference because it will trickle down and out through society. People will become much less uh, concerned with um, sort of uh, uh, reasons for privacy that aren't always necessary, right? So. And at the end, I put here the ICA. Two, these are two statements from their, their universal declaration on archives, OK? And you can go to their web page and find this. The ICA believes that effective records and archives management is an essential precondition for good governance. The rule of law, administrative transparency, the preservation of mankind's collective memory, and access to information by citizens. We therefore undertake to work together in order that appropriate national archive policies and laws are adopted and enforced, and that archives are made accessible to everyone while respecting the pertinent laws and the rights of individuals, creators, owners, and users. That pretty much says it all, doesn't it? So my last page here is a um, list of links for you. The International Council on Archives Universal Statements got a Cantonese version, so for anybody who's more comfortable with that, boom, there you go. And the Society of American Archivists homepage. These are the two links for the consultancy report. May I remind everybody here you've got three weeks left to comment, and we want to hear you. Take the time to write and send your comments about either one of the subcommittee's reports into these two links, please. And then the final one is the International Standards Organization. And this is their catalog page online for their electronic archives and records management. So those of you who are interested in sort of policy stuff, you can have a look there. OK? Thanks very much. Thank you, Mrs. Lee. Would all our speakers please come up to the stage for the Cut Across Dialogue. In this session, our speakers will discuss interdisciplinary research and knowledge exchange project ideas that could be made possible by open data.
Well, I'm afraid we've just about run out of time, and I'm sure you all want to go and have a cup of coffee before you go home. So I'm just going to ask each of the academics to give one example of a data set or, or something like data which they would like to have access to, which they currently can't get access to, and why that would be useful. So, Victor, you've already given us a foresight of yours. I'll let you go first. Okay, so uh, I think uh, the lens department, okay, obviously. Uh, another government department is the health, uh, is the hospital authority. And uh, I think uh, if we can get uh, data from the hospital authority, they will allow us to uh, analyze the relationship between, let's say, air pollution and uh, asthma attacks, uh, things like that. I think, uh, just like you, John, I'm actually interested in seeing if the police can give us access to data relating to uh, prosecution, crime, uh, and activity broken down across the different vectors that I talked about in my presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, the first is probably lens department's data um, for us to build a better uh, uh, urban digital to win for smart city applications. For uh, illegal dumping of constru construction waste, I probably need more uh, some data from the EPD or from some legal uh, cases descriptions. Thank you. So I'm I'm interested in the uh, genomic data for the uh, from the pathogens, and uh, I think the uh, the laboratory, the biological laboratory or bacterial laboratory from the uh, uh, Department of Health can. Uh, if they can open the, uh, the genomic data that they uh, sequence from their samples, would be very useful for uh, other uh, uh, scientists to also join in and analyze the, the data to understand the disease better. Okay, so Stacey, you get, you get to say one thing you would like to change in order to, to make things better for, for access to data. Okay, I'm going to talk about data in my own house then, in the Hong Kong U archives. Um, I've had a project in mind for a number of years about uh, records that we'd like to digitize in order to make them available to a much wider audience and also to minimize wear and tear on our pre-war records. And it's an enormous undertaking. You're talking about about 1,000 linear feet or more of... Um, images and records from pre-1945. Uh, and uh, Or in my case, I might stretch it to like 48. But, um, but uh, yeah, when I, when I think about being the provider right now, that's my heart's desire. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've, we've already gone beyond our time, so I think we're gonna, gonna give it a wrap now. There is tea and coffee outside still. Well, okay, we'll have Q&A for, for five or 10 minutes. Who's, who's got the mics? Yeah. Any questions? Yes. One over there. And one over there. Uh, hi, Sky Edmonds, Open Data Hong Kong and Giga Science. Um, great bunch of talks. A lot of them had in common the they had problems getting hold of the data. Um, example of uh, data, uh, the lands department kept cropping up. Um, it costs, they get four million Hong Kong dollars a year in data recovery charges. It costs $760,000 to get all of the tiles, which is the problem that um, you're having here. Um, but then the, and it's supposed to be data recovery, but the topography data that's not as marketable, it, they give it away for free. So it kind of, that, that's a that, that's a bit suspicious, and you know the the, the archive, you know the, these consultations are coming up. We actually have a chance to um, have a uh, ha have a say in a lot of this. Um, for example, they want to bring in data charges for FOI. For example, as as researchers, are, are you um, as data users, uh, are, do you feel you're going to? Um, at, uh, rather than use it, you know, use this opportunity to try and lobby for better access for this? I, mean, I think the short answer is yes, but again, one of the things I hinted at in my presentation, the, the problem is academics often get a special deal, right? We often pay a lot less than everyone else. Uh, so I think we have to all agree to work together that this should be free to everyone unless there is a very compelling reason, not just to some people. 
Right, we had another question from the back there. Uh, thank you. I'm sure uh, our research in the mainland China. Uh, thanks for the quite interesting speech. Uh, I have one question for Professor Lee. Uh, because we tend to emphasize uh, the correlation rather than the causal lead for big data analysis. So here comes the question. Uh, is it possible to make a bad decision if we rely on the correlation rather than the causal lead? If so, uh, how can we avoid? If not, why? Thank you. Well, so this happens to be one of his research interests is, is Granger causality, right? Spatial temporal. So he can give you a lecture afterwards where he'll explain <laughs> to you how, yes, he can do that, okay? Right, as we're short of time. Okay. <laughs> so he will give you a personal lecture. You wanna add anything? No, that's fine. <laughs> do we have any other questions? Yes, Jacqueline. So while we researchers are looking for data, are there any mechanisms to avoid the misuse of data? Uh, like, for instance, in Hong Kong, we don't have ISIS. What happens if in the future these are going to be in the custody of some bad guys? Are there any mechanisms to avoid? Anybody want to have a try at that one? <laughs> Well, I, I think actually we, I've had a, a conversation a little bit like this with Stacy before. Mm. The issue is that if it's open, it's open, right? Once it's open, everybody can have access to it for, for better or worse. Mm -hmm. So if you really believe it's open, then you don't have the ability to say who can and cannot use it. So that's, ex that's why I made the distinction that if there is a good reason, so if there is a reason for privacy or for security, you have to be clear about that up front, because once it's out there, that's the end of the story. So there are numerous examples of, for example, where Yahoo or Netflix released data which were anonymized, which they thought was safe, but then they discovered actually people could re-identify things. And once it's out there in the internet, it's out for good, right? You can't put the genie back in the bottle. So I think the short answer is there's nothing we can do except to be very careful at the beginning to make sure those, that we make those decisions right. Stacey, you wanna add anything? Um, yeah, I don't know. Can you, is this working? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think that there's a perfect answer for that. Um, my attitude, which has been shaped by where I was raised, and where I was trained in the country with the oldest Freedom of Information Act in the world, right? In the US, it was 1966. And we made it so broad and so free that in fact afterwards we had to pass legislation to kind of pull back and give people some protection that they needed. And so two of the pieces of legislation that we passed after that were the Family and Education Right to Privacy Act so that people couldn't come, say, to Hong Kong U and say, I want to see this person's grades and their teacher's comments and blah, 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 blah. Those things are now protected until death under the data privacy ordinance here in Hong Kong. And then the other one was the Health, and Health Information and Patient Privacy Act because people were doing bad things with medical records and particularly they were discriminating against HIV positive individuals, which was not very nice. Um, so yeah, there has to be a balance in the law, and there has to be a balance in closure periods. You know, I won't take something into the archives that does not have a finite opening date. But for instance, in the case of the census data that John and I were discussing earlier, almost every single country in the world makes their census, the original raw census data, available for research, but not usually until 100 years after the census was taken. Because this is a long enough time to protect the privacy of living individuals in most cases. Now John's just gonna, I can just see his head. <laughs> because there have unfortunately been some instances of people using census data from the past to do nasty, racist things to individuals in, in the present. Well, in fact, the problem is not just that people yeah. outside, but the government themselves have often abused the census data. So having it around has certain unintended consequences that you need to have thought through very carefully. Yeah. Any last question? 
If not, thank you. Oh, yes, one more. We'll get you a mic. Sorry, just wait a minute, please. Uh, I remember maybe a couple of years ago, there's a, a issue that uh, uh, bring in, in the topics is the right to forgotten. Uh, you know the data when it's open, it's actually even you don't keep it, somebody else will keep it, just like the uh, yeah. celebrity photos we, we all see some times ago. So uh, do you think we need to uh, uh, take care of this issue okay. so, so when I we open the data? The whole audience for several hours about this. The right to be forgotten is a very terrible way to, to frame what that issue is about. It's actually about the right to be rehabilitated. So we generally all believe in rehabilitation, but the problem with somewhere like the US, which has a very effective freedom of information, but does not have a very effective data protection law, is they're not balanced very well. So the famous case in Europe was about somebody where actually what the courts ruled was not that the record should be taken away, but the indexing through Google should be blocked. So you're blocking the indexing so that everybody can just type in your name and find everything about you, right? So it's only the indexing that was being affected by that, that ruling, not the record itself. So anyway, there are, there are tricky issues, but I agree. The critical issue is actually about rehabilitation. So I think we all believe in rehabilitation, but how to facilitate that is actually a very difficult question. But again, I think that's generally about personal data. And I think most of the focus here today is there's a lot of non-personal data out there which isn't yet accessible, so let's focus on that first. I think probably we can, most of us can agree with that. Unless there's a very compelling na national security or public health argument, there is actually, it's very hard to see what other reason there is not to make data open. So can I leave that as a summary for today, please? Thank you all very much. On behalf of so, the Knowledge Exchange yes, Office, we, oh, yeah. we would like to extend our deepest appreciation and gratitude to all our distinguished guests and speakers for being here with us today. It's been our pleasure to host this event. Please scan the QR code on the program to complete an evaluation survey for the event. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. May I now invite everyone to move to